Good evening, everyone. Pleased to see everyone out tonight. Uh, we may be a few short of our normal number for a Wednesday night, but that's fine. Um, before we begin tonight, let's uh, go to God in prayer. Father, we're indeed very grateful that we can be here tonight, that you have given us your word to guide us in all matters of life. Father, we ask that it would be with those who are ill, those who for one reason or the other cannot be with us this evening, that you would see to their needs. Father, guide and direct us as we study this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Forgiveness is the topic tonight. The, if we think about forgiveness, really there's two forgiveness, two types maybe. There's God to man forgiveness, and there's person to person forgiveness. That pretty well covers it. I uh, want to ask a few open-ended questions, and I don't expect an answer, but be thinking about these as we go through tonight. I may comment on a couple of them before we get into Scripture this evening. But have you forgiven anyone lately? If so, why did you forgive them? Why would you forgive someone that did something wrong to you? Hmm? Yes, it is. In fact, it helps sometimes you as much as the other person. And we'll get, hopefully touch a little more on that. And I guess this is probably a, a question that has an easy answer, but have you asked for forgiveness from God? Or have you asked for forgiveness from another person lately? Sometimes, you know, asking for forgiveness to someone is kind of hard because of something we call pride. We don't like to humble ourselves and go to someone and say, you know, will you forgive me? I did something wrong. Or I feel like I did something wrong. But what about if the person that did wrong to you, they're not even sorry. Uh, don't ask for forgiveness. Do you forgive them anyway? Here's the big question. If you do forgive someone, do you forget the transgression? Have you ever heard someone say, well, I'll forgive them, but I'll never forget. So think about that for a minute as we go through and as we look at some scriptures this evening. Think about whether that type of forgiveness is really forgiveness or not, at least the forgiveness of the Bible. Uh, turn to Colossians chapter 3. And beginning with verse 12, Colossians chapter 3, beginning with verse 12. And this is sort of the core scripture tonight, but we're going to look at a number of others. Starting with verse 12, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if any has, anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful." Going back to verse 12 for just a little bit, we'll touch on this type of comment more than once tonight, but we're talking about forgiveness. Now, why do we need tender mercies and kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering? You know, I think if you don't have some of those qualities, it's going to be pretty hard to forgive somebody. If you're not kind, if you're not loving, 
If, you, if you're not humble enough to ask for forgiveness or to forgive someone, and if you're not long-suffering sometimes, how are you going to do what verse 13 says? Even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Didn't say maybe do it or once in a while do it. It says we must do it. Now, as we look at this, we need to look or less, I guess, a little bit about why should we forgive people? Why do we need to forgive others? You know, we are a new creation in Christ, and this newness includes a new attitude towards others. If you look at the world around you, they're not always so kind. Uh, they're not always forgiving. In fact, sometimes they're downright cruel. And we live in a world and have to deal with people like that. But once we are in Christ, a new creature, we should have a new attitude towards others and each other, especially towards each other uh, in the church. And the Bible gives us several reasons to forgive. And maybe the first one you've already thought of, we've been forgiven. Those in Christ have been forgiven. Looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and starting with verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all the things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their, their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Verse 21 sort of hits the nail on the head. He made Christ who knew no sin to be sin for us to sacrifice himself for us that we might have forgiveness. We'll look a little more at some different angles from that, but basically, if God did this for us, then who are we to deny forgiveness to others? You know, I often think that we think about the suffering of Christ on the cross, all the physical suffering and so forth, but what was it like for Christ who knew no sin to be sin for us? A perfect being having to take on the sins of the world for forgiveness of the sins of the world. What about Romans 5, verses 8 and 9? But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. You know, that's, when you look at the world around you and you look at people in the world, that's pretty amazing that while we were sinners, while we were uh, not doing what God wanted us to do, he sent Christ to die for us. He sent Christ to die for even the most wicked person in this world if they would only turn to God. Through uh, all of the Bible, even going back in the Old Testament, the, look at the nation of Israel. He uh, tried to protect them, to save them, to keep them uh, pr uh, prosperous, if you will, to keep them close to him, and yet they failed time and time again. Today, those of us that are in Christ, when we stray, we fail God again. But we need to remember that the forgiveness offered by God 
is exactly one of the main reasons that we need to be forgiving people. If God has forgiven us for all that we have done, then surely we need to be able to reciprocate as God has asked us to do. And to add another verse that looks closely the uh, same thing in a way, but in, in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Every Sunday when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we remember Christ's body and blood on the cross. And we remember what that was done for us and the forgiveness there for us that his blood was shed for the remission of our sins, for the sins of the world. So one of the reasons that uh, we need to forgive is the fact that God has forgiven us. He's paid the ultimate sacrifice for us. As we look back and think then, well, if Christ forgave us, did all this for us, then we forgive others. We've been told to forgive others. In Ephesians 4.32, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. You know, the, sometimes we look at things and we think about things such as being tenderhearted and forgiving, and we probably don't give a lot of thought to it at times. Uh, what, what we just read in verse 32 of Ephesians chapter 4 is really the opposite of the things that were forbidden in verse 31. Ephesians 4.31 reads, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. We're not to have those things in our life. And then he turns right around in verse 32 and telling us to be kind and tenderhearted. You know, the world, there's a lot of bitterness, anger, and wrath and clamor going on. If you listen to the news on any day, uh, you see what the evil that's going on and the, the anger people have. And we're to be different from that. Uh, those that are so angry, they don't seem to be the forgiving type. But those in Christ are to forgive. This verse 32 says, be kind to one another. You know, how do you feel when somebody's kind to you? It makes you feel good, doesn't it? Even if it's somebody you don't know if they do some kind thing for, even something simple like maybe holding the door for you as you walk into a building. It feels good for someone to do that for you. Uh, as we look at the world today, there are people that do kind things. Uh, I went into Chick-fil-A today and a person held the door for me as I went in. May have been because I looked old and decrepit, but they held the door for me. So I, I felt good about that. Uh, you know, one person said, Kaufman quoted a, a uh, McKnight and about being tenderhearted. And he said, the precept is very different from that of Epictetus who spoke to this person, purpose. If one is in affliction, thou may say to him, thou hast pity on him, but take care not to feel any pity. Now to me, I sum that up as lip service. You say something nice to someone or you forgive somebody, but it's just lip service. You don't really feel anything inside at all. So we have to watch that we don't look like we're being kind and tenderhearted we don't look like we're forgiving when in the inside it doesn't mean anything to us at all. We're just saying the right words and, and looking to do the right thing. The, and I have to uh, compliment, and it sort of uh, helped uh, this lesson tonight, but Kevin Turner and JP, both of their lessons, touched on some things in this lesson tonight. And one of them, uh, or maybe both of them, I don't remember, 
touched on the longest uh, parable that Matthew recorded, which is the unmerciful servant. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 35, I'm not going to read all that this evening, but if you remember, a uh, master had called in a servant that owed him a tremendous sum of money. And the servant pleaded with him and pleaded with him, and finally the master said, I forgive you. You don't have any debt anymore. And then he went out and found another servant that owed him a small amount of money, demanded payment, and then had him thrown into prison until he could uh, indeed uh, pay the bill. So if you remember how that concluded, um, the master found out about that. He called the first servant that had been forgiven back and had him thrown in uh, jail, if you will, until he could pay. The end of that parable, these words, so shall also my heavenly Father do unto you if ye forgive not every one his brother from your heart. Remember, Kevin was talking about from the heart in his lesson uh, last Sunday morning. Some person, one person uh, phrased it this way, the watchword for Christians and for all people is forgive or forfeit forgiveness. Now that's sort of a sobering thought to think about. If we become so uh, tight, if you will, uh, so unforgiving, uh, where is our forgiveness? Our forgiveness can be cut off. You know, as we think a little bit more, going back again to Colossians 3, uh, verses 12 to 15, uh, the character of the new man, if you will. I want to keep stressing tonight the importance. If we're going to forgive, we've got to have the right kind of, uh, and we'll get to Galatians in a little bit, the right kind of fruits, the good fruits in our lives. If you're the angry and clamoring type that we just discussed above a little bit, for, uh, a little bit ago, it's going to be tough for you to forgive. But Colossians chapter 3, again, talks about the tender mercies the kindness that we talked about, humility. You know, forgiveness takes a little bit of humility, uh, particularly if you're the guilty one that has to go and ask for forgiveness. You have to push your pride aside. You have to be willing to be a little bit humble and go and hope that the other person will be receptive to, to you telling them that you were wrong and then go on. But, you know, as somebody mentioned a while ago, that's really two-sided because once you do that, you may feel better than the person that's getting the apology because it does lift a burden off you. If you don't forgive, what do you do with that in your mind and so forth? You carry that with you. And sometimes that grows. And what became a little misunderstanding becomes something that's anger and something that you try to get back at a person or try to get revenge on a person. And I'm sure all of you have seen that uh, in workplaces and other places in your life. So we need to be careful that as Christians, we're showing forth the humility and kindness that we have, meekness, if you will, and long-suffering. You know, God is long-suffering with us. Sometimes we have to be long-suffering with our fellow man. Uh, you may ask for forgiveness and you still may not get it, or you may get the word service thing, but they're holding a grudge against you. Sometimes it takes a while to get to the point to where you truly have that understanding back again. And didn't mention, talk, talk about it a while ago, but you mentioned in verse 14 of Colossians chapter 3, said, above all things, put on love. You know, as people, sometimes you may think we have it, some people are harder to love than others, let's put it that way. Uh, but we're to, to love others and especially within our brotherhood and your fellow Christians. And sometimes, and if you've been around in church long enough in different places and so forth, you've seen sometimes when there's not brotherly love between two or three people in the church. So love is very important that we don't forget that. Now, another reason, if 
we're the type that forgives as God has asked us to, we're displaying Christ in our daily lives for others to see. Uh, we're display Jesus in our lives, if you will. What about Jesus? He forgave others, did he not? Uh, let's look at uh, a few examples. Remember in Mark chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, the paralytic. And he entered Capernaum and some, uh, after some days and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door, and he preached the word to them. And they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and, and reasoning within their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven you, or say, Arise and take your bed and walk. But they, that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, take up your bed and go to, the, go to your house. Now, just as Jesus was criticized there, sometimes your acts of kindness, sometimes your acts of, of forgiveness may be criticized by others. Uh, you may forgive someone of the deed and someone else may say to you, you know, you shouldn't do that. They may even be critical of you for your actions to forgive. But Jesus uh, here went ahead and forgave. He also remember the uh, woman in adultery in John chapter 8. Uh, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives and early in the morning he came down into the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Notice that someone as pure and sin-free and forgiving as Jesus still had people criticizing him and trying to bring him down. Uh, those that thought they were the proud and the upper ones and the religious leaders, they didn't want any competition from anybody else. Now, they went on to say, Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What do you say? They said this testing him that they might have something of which to accuse him. And if you remember the rest of that story, uh, Jesus stood there. And we don't really ever know what he wrote in the ground, but he sat there write, writing something in the ground with his, with his hand. And he then said, who, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. The thing that amazes me about this is that the scribes and Pharisees that came there with uh, to make this accusation walked away and uh, really took to their heart that they had sin in their lives. Usually they seem so kind of puffed up that they feel like they're pure and, and they're good. But they did. They walked away with everyone else. And in verse 10, he's, he's, Jesus said, Woman, where are your accusers? He has no one condemned you. And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. You also may remember back to the thief on the cross. Uh, remember, there were two thieves there. One of them uh, ridiculed Jesus. The other one uh, wanted to be remembered. And Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, you will be with me in paradise. So if we're supposed to try to model our lives after Christ, he continuously forgave in circumstances with people that were worthy of forgiveness or that asked for forgiveness, had faith, and so forth. Kind of touched on this, but, you know, some people's lives are such that they don't read the Bible. They've never been to church in their lives. The only person they may see to show them some image of Jesus and may have some 
effect of leading them to Christ may be you. Hatefulness in the world pushes people away. The, the things that we just talked about a while ago tend to bring people in. And if we're that type of person, uh, we, have, we have a better chance of having the effect that we should have on others and trying to bring them to Christ. Uh, in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Second uh, Corinthians 3.18, But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in the mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed in the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. You know, if we look at ourselves and give an honest opinion of ourselves, who are other people seeing when they see you? Whether it's in the workplace, in the Walmart, at the gas station, wherever, uh, what do they see by your actions? Sometimes your action may be something that is neither plus or minus there, but other times they may see how you interact with, the, say, the, the uh, checkout person at Walmart. Uh, you know, one of the most ungrateful jobs in this world is the people that have to work at retail sales or selling food or what have you that has to deal with the public. And if any of you have ever done that in your life, you know, that can be a difficult situation sometimes. People are just not very nice at times. Now, how you handle those situations show either Christ or just another person in the world with a bad attitude. Romans 12, 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. As we also further think, think about uh, what our forgiveness can do, what about keeping other brethren from going, if you will, to the devil, so to speak. You know, sometimes our forgiveness can have such an effect on an individual that it may turn them around. Or if we shove them away with hatred and revenge and so forth, it may drive them further away. Maybe someone in the church and you've had a disagreement with and, and they've done wrong to you and, and instead of being forgiving and trying to reconcile you push back, you push them away. That may be the reason some people walk out the door, never come back. Um, take an example. Remember the man in Corinth in uh, 1 Colossians 5, chapter 1, and, and verses following, I'll just read the first verse, is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as not even named among the Gentiles that a man has his father's wife. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 1 uh, and following, uh, they, uh, we see an instance here where Paul is talking and most traditional interpretation of this is it's the same man, but he has repented, if you will. And 2 uh, Corinthians 2 verse 5, but if anyone has caused grief, he has not grieved me, but all of you to some extent, not to be too severe. The punishment which was inflicted by the majority is sufficient for such a man, so that you, on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. For to this end I also write that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. Now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive, for if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. Least Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. We must be careful how we handle things with our brethren in the church, that we don't force them out the door, if you will, or give them the opinion that they're not wanted here, they, they've repented, and yet we still standoffish, 
reject them, and then before long they feel, I'm not wanted here. So they walk out and they may go nowhere else. Uh, as we look at restoring people that maybe have gone astray, uh, forgiveness is a vital part of that. Uh, if a person's had trouble in their life and, and maybe have gone away from the Lord for a while and we're trying to bring them back, uh, our complete forgiveness of them, if, if that's what they're wanting, uh, is something that we indeed is a, a very essential part of restoring that person. Uh, Galatians 6, 1, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. And that is something we have to watch out for. Uh, if we go to a, a brethren that's uh, astray and trying to bring him back, be careful that in your want to be kind to him and, and to be accepted by him so you can bring him back, that you don't fall into doing the same things that he's doing. James 5, 19, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and tur someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. You notice that in Galatians we just read that gentleness came back in, that kindness again, set in the spirit of gentleness and kindness. Uh, you can't go, and at least most people you can't, you can't go and, and uh, get in their face and yell at them, telling them what they've got to do and have any hope of, of getting any reception. Uh, you've got to somehow get in a situation to where you can talk to them on a one-on-one -on -one and that they can know that, that you indeed are there for their benefit and not for someone to put them down. Uh, in Matthew chapter 18 again, before uh, we got into the parable of the unforgiving servant that we already mentioned, uh, remember how that started out in verse 21 of Matthew chapter 18. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall I my brother sin against me and I forgive him up to seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. You know, sometimes we look for an out to where, okay, I've forgiven this guy for this three, four, five times. I can quit now, right? I mean, why should I continue with him? I'm out of patience with him. Well, think about God, our Heavenly Father. If he only forgave us three, four, or five times for any one offense, uh, where would we be if he said, that's enough, I don't want any more to do with you. We'd have a lot of people lost. And Jim, I want to point out, uh, when somebody comes forward, like at the close of service, asking for, for prayers or repentance or whatever their need is, you know, it's oftentimes we see that person go forward one time and we all feel relief and we're proud of that person. We see him go forward the second time Okay, we're so proud of them trying to get back to prayer before it was big and sick. Now, now there's that feeling that, well, I mean, if you've gone forward six times, are you really broke? Right. And that's not for us to judge. We're to forgive and support and encourage that, that brother or sister. You know, however many times it takes for them to get their stuff in order, we're to encourage and uplift and try to help that individual. Not to make excuses, not that that's what right. is referred to as considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. That means making excuses or exclusions to things, you know, trying to make that person feel better. But by all means, we need to be encouraging and spend a lot less time judging. Uh, that's a good point. I'm glad you mentioned that because be honest with yourself. Have any of you ever been in a church where somebody's repeatedly gone forward that way? and have not had a little nagging thought in the back of your mind, and maybe let your thoughts wander to say, well, you know, why is he still going forward, you know? Uh, so we need to make sure that we treat people properly. And to go along with that, when someone goes forward that way, there should be at least a few fellow Christians go up to, to reassure and comfort that person so there's a show that the, the congregation indeed supports them in trying to, to get back right. As we think about some application tonight, 
and then we'll look at some conclusioning thoughts. We all stand in need of forgiveness for God. For one thing, if we had no forgiveness from God, then we're totally lost. And even after we obey the gospel, uh, no one's perfect. All have sinned and fallen short. So we need forgiveness. We must have mercy upon others and forgive them. Uh, without it, we cannot be forgiven. In Matthew 6, 14, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. You know, that's a, that's a pretty hard, direct, no way to get out of that statement. If uh, we expect forgiveness, we have to be a forgiving person. So, Forgiveness is a vital part of our Christian life. Others see God through us, see Christ through us, how we react, how we treat people. We have a good, better chance of restoring our brothers and sisters in Christ if they go astray or if they try to leave the church if we are a forgiving type person, if we are an understanding person, if we have the attitude of being kind and gentle and have a, a attitude that we're going to work with them and try to not be one that just sits there and judge them and, and uh, tell, tell them what they've got to do, but try to bring them to the scriptures that can help them see how to live their life. might say, if you will, our souls are made secure when we show forgiveness to others. And if we're going to be like Jesus, which all Christians should be striving to do and to be as perfect as we can, we must be a forgiving person. Um, I think First John is one that we go to often and it's reassuring to the Christian, but there are some conditional statements made there. First John chapter 1, verse 5, beginning. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he's in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. You know, this is very comforting to a Christian, but make sure you always remember back up in verse 7, uh, if we walk in the light as he is in the light. So if we go astray, we need to be asking for forgiveness and get back on the track, if you will. And I mentioned, you know, when we were talking Ephesians 4.32 about tenderhearted, forgiving, and so forth, it makes one remember uh, Galatians chapter 5, beginning with verse 22, when we talk about the fruits of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with his passions and desire. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. You know, a lot of misunderstandings, uh, a lot of quarreling, if you will, comes about by envying people and provoking them in some way. Uh, you know, if somebody seems like they're becoming more prestigious in a local congregation, sometimes other people will envy that person and that causes uh, trouble, if you will. But we're to go back here to start with, and it's pretty much like 432 in the Ephesians. Uh, you know, the love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, those things keep us where we should be. 
And I always remember, I think, started thinking about this too, as we think about forgiving others and so forth, we have to be at the right place. And I, we keep coming back to when uh, Christ was asked, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Christ gave them two. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. If we love God, as that verse instructs us to do, it's going to be a whole lot easier for us to forgive others. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and prophets. Yes, indeed, if we love our neighbor as ourself, uh, we usually like to be able to forgive ourselves anyway. We should be forgiving our, our neighbor as well. And if we possess the straight uh, fruits of the Spirit, it should also make that easier. A couple quick questions here. We're about out of time, but um, going back to a couple uh, things in the Old Testament, uh, some word pictures, if you will, of forgiveness. In Psalms 103.12, as far as the east is from the west, so far he hath removed our transgressions from us. And Isaiah 38.17, the good king Hezekiah thanked the Lord for his redemption, proclaiming that you have thrown all my sins behind your back. Prophet Micah is even more picturesque. He describes Jehovah as treading our iniquities under his feet and then casting the residue into the sea. That's how the Old Testament uh, pictured, if you will, in word pictures what God did as he forgave those at the time. What about, uh, can forgiveness be conditional? What about us when we uh, obeyed the gospel? Was that conditional in us receiving God's forgiveness? God's willing to forgive us our sins, but we've got to do a couple things, don't we? And it can be the same sort of way as people. You know, you think about a person forgiving someone that's done a horrible act, and you say, well, what does that mean? You know, that person may say, I forgive them, and that may be true, but that doesn't mean that that person is forgiven by God and that per unless that person repents of that sin. Also, what about somebody that's done something like uh, murdered a relative of yours, for instance? You may be strong enough to say, I forgive that person, but that does not mean that the justice system is still not going to extract justice, whatever is required for that. And that doesn't mean the person that said, I forgive you, has to go and try to hinder the law to get the person off or anything. There are conditional things or things that happen to us when we do things that are not right. And we still have those consequences in our life, even if God forgives us. So conditional, yes, sometimes things are conditional. We may forgive the person, but unless they go and repent uh, to God, they may not be forgiven. So you may feel, they may feel better that you feel better towards them, but God may not have forgiven them unless they repent and turn their life around. We're just about uh, ready for the bell here, and according to my watch, uh, any other comments or questions before we close? Thank you for your time this evening.